<laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> the ground is shaky. Oh, how is everyone out there? Oh, my heavens. What May a time. you live in interesting times. What a time to be alive, right? Right. 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 <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> wow. Um, what a difference a week makes, you know? No kidding. Yeah. Kind of finished up last week with love in the time of cholera. Ha ha ha. Hi, Karen. Hi, Anne Marie. Hi, I'm Kareen. Um, yeah. And then, whoop. Yeah. And now Michelle it's shows the only up. Thing. Denise, it's the, yeah, Emily. Hello, Emily, new wayfinder. Yes. Yay. Welcome. Emily Elizabeth. What a beautiful name. Yes. Susan, not Marianne Bros. So we have two Marianne's and then and Marie's and Blanca. Nice. Hello, Hi. darling. Nick. Nick, hey. Hi. Evelyn's um, is having a rough time. Oh, no kidding. Well, what isn't? Frankly. Yeah. That's how it be. Rough, rough times. But look at this. Look at us gathering Here we are in our community, loving on each other. Look at this. In the middle of it all. <coughs> Nothing to worry about. You're all in the clear. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. No, you're not. We start out and Ro kept saying, just remind them nothing you say is medical advice. <laughs> nothing you say is medical advice. Marty can sometimes get excited and she's reading a lot about it. And, and declarative. You I can get declar declarative. Yeah, it's just my way. Like I declare. declare. You do declare. Yeah, I was raised to declare things. <laughs> I've got, when I look, turn to look at you, I've got this one little bit of hair. I know this isn't the point, guys. I know That's stuff your is protective going on. hair tendril. Everyone must have one. <laughs> it keeps my aura green. <laughs> <laughs> so I think if people are starting to, we're people reaching a here. critical mass. Yes, all, the, so, all these terms. Just all these so terms awesome. are sounding so bad, but there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. All right. So, the wisdom is coming. I'll be back later, you guys. Well, so this is big Q&A time. Like if you have any questions at all, please like fire them out here because this is a time of enormous uncertainty. I was, um, I have all, we, all my career, I have been talking about exponential growth curves because when I was starting my graduate program at Harvard in 1930, um, there was a field called futurology. And this was a subsection of sociology that could extrapolate from history what was going to happen in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. Well, there is no future. By the time I graduated, there was no such thing as futurology because the rate of change went from gradual to quite steep to vertical. And the pace of change was increasing along with change itself. So change is increasing, but also the rate at which it is at which change is increasing is increasing. And finally, the futurologists threw up their hands and said, this is not predictable. So we live in an age of fundamental unpredictability. And it's so weird because first we went through this long period of time as a species where we were like, what the hell is happening with the weather? I don't know. <laughs> then we went through a brief period of, we know everything. You know, in 1989, they almost closed down the patent office because everything that could be discovered had been discovered. We were sure as a species that we knew what was coming. And now, mainly because of what we ourselves have created with our own exponential growth curve as a population and our, our effect on the environment, we are once again in a thing of like, oh no, what's happening? So, there are ways that we can know our environment, but it's really humbling to find yourself in one exponential growth curve after another. And we've all seen over the past few weeks how there, there have been different growth curves. One is the growth curve, of course, of the coronavirus, COVID-19. And you all saw how, you know, it started, Italy's a good case to look at because, oh, there were some cases in Italy. Now there were like 100 cases in Italy. And now it's like, they don't have enough beds and um, doctors are having to decide whom to treat and make these awful choices. So that's gone nuts in the last little while. I'm sorry I'm dating this video. It's just going to continue getting weirder. Um, but at this point, and possibly for the next several weeks, maybe even months, we simply don't have enough testing data in the US to know exactly how far it spread and thereby to predict how far it may spread. My county is under lockdown. Everybody's locking down. Everybody's trying to do their best. 
And here's the thing, uncertainty. So we're at this place where even people who predict the future say it's un fundamentally unpredictable. We're in the middle of something we know is an exponential growth curve, but we have no idea how far it's spread or, or where the, the curve will go. And our psychological curve is kind of running ahead of the actual like problem in the world. So the, the wave of knowledge went from, oh, that's a thing in China, to, oh my gosh, the poor Iranians, to, holy crap, it's in the house, you know? And that, that went faster than the actual transmission of any virus. Information, memes travel even faster than viral genes. So when you get to a state of maxed out uncertainty, the human brain no like that. The human brain wants something to hang on to and it wants something to control. And so at times of uncertainty, we revert to doing strange things. And a lot of them are like evolutionary strange things. Uh, the, you know, we went to the store yesterday and the shelves were, there were whole shelves, whole sections of the grocery store that were completely bought out. Toilet paper is getting so incredibly precious that I think we might be able to start using it as currency soon. Just, I'll trade you toilet paper for food. Um, that's, a, that's called gallows humor, by the way. And let me just say a note about this. I mentioned this on a gathering room a while back. I was reading a book called Deep Survival about people who get out of terribly frightening situations by a guy named Lawrence Gonzalez. And one of the things, he studied people who were in terrible situations and got out okay. And one of the things he found, the first thing he mentioned that got them out okay was gallows humor. People who can be in a devastating situation and start to laugh at the situation itself, even though they're aware how bad it is, those people have a kind of hardiness psychologically that keeps them from panicking and panic is what leads people to do really stupid things where lots of people get hurt for no reason. So a lot of people are panicking and I could see the panic buying in the supermarket. Was doing a little myself, I have to say, I was putting several jars of peanut butter in the cart when Rose stopped me and said, I think two is enough. Um, but it was a very animal sensation. I will need peanut butter in the coming famine. There's not gonna be a famine. This is not correlated with famine the way like war is. Um, so there are things we don't have to be afraid of that we're afraid of. And there are, things, there are places where we maybe are not alert enough where we should be quite alert. The idea, I think, and I love Lawrence Gonzalez and the gallows humor because what it does is it allows us as something is really happening in the world that has not happened really since 1918, the Spanish flu. My father was eight years old during that flu and like it was primitive compared to now. And he, I, I've heard him before he passed away, talk about um, his brothers and he looking out the windows of their house to see which houses were having coffins delivered that day, like to see which of the neighbors were dying. We are so much better off because of the, look at what we're able to do. We're able to gather in a large group here virtually without infecting each other. And, and that's incredible. That's gonna give us such a level of safety compared to what they had back then. So we have all these advantages, but on the other hand, we've never been through this before. And so the idea is not to ignore it and not to panic. So there's what they call an optimal state of alertness. And it starts with, I don't really care. It's not a big deal. And it goes up to, oh, maybe it is a big deal. To, oh, this is a really big deal. I should pay attention to, uh, maybe I just go over here now. And then to, Oh wait, no, I did it wrong. So no, it's a terrible deal. It's really bad, it's really bad. To, I'm going to buy all the, the toilet paper in the Western states and I will kill you for your toilet paper. That's where you don't wanna go. You wanna be in that middle where you're like, hmm, interesting situation. The way you know you're there is if you're making jokes about it. Cause that means your attention is on it, but you're not freaking out, you're being brave. And that's where we've also talked about victimization and how bad it is for people psychologically and how the cure for feeling like a victim is to become a creator. So one of the things that I would really suggest to cope with this is 
do something constructive, make a constructive thing happen. One of the first things that, uh, that we did in my company was say, what can we create to help people through the next few months? You know, we can't, we're not medical uh, specialists, but by God, we study the way change works and the way people can handle it. And we are going to go out as a company and we are going to freaking help people. And it went from all of us going, oh crap, to everybody being like, yeah. And if nothing else, that positive attitude is going to help us stay well. And if you have anything you can make, people are having their kids write letters to people who are alone in nursing homes. So the kids have something to do while they're out of school and the older people know someone cares. Things that you can do to bond together emotionally, even if you are social distancing. So start thinking in terms of being creative and being loving and also being alert and paying attention to um, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization and all the data output they're doing and the recommendations. Follow them to the letter, wash your hands and put on lotion because otherwise they'll crack and then you've got a crack in your hand through which germs can pass, so do it both. All of this to say that if we can stay in that place of high appropriate alertness, we are going to feel like we've got our feet on the ground all the time. We're gonna feel balanced. I believe, and this is not a medical opinion for this crisis, but it is well documented in much literature that the more you feel in control of your life and the more creative you're being and the more optimistic you are, the better you're able to resist and conquer disease. So there's that, but I'm not a doctor. There's just that. Then um, there's the fact that you're gonna come up with more creative ideas that will help people survive and also help flatten the curve of the epidemic itself. So if you can stay alert, connected, and in a zone where you can tell stories and find humor in them, you are going to be ideally positioned, I'm gonna say again what I always say, to be a spiritual being having a human experience at a time of unprecedented pandemic. And one person who is really balanced and who's really able to, I, I believe, feel guided in that spiritual way can become a calming force for tens, hundreds, thousands, millions. If you can stay in that place, if all of us, are, like we've got 426 people on the line right now by, by the count on my computer, if all 426 of us got to that place of calm alertness and we were, were all sharing and we were all creating and we were all optimistic and we were all washing our hands, we could become a force that creates yet another exponential growth curve. And that is an exponential growth curve of courage, of resourcefulness, of reaching out to help in ways that are safe and sound, of coming together as a species. For the first time in my lifetime, all of humanity is looking at the same problem. We are united as a species in a way we've never been before because even in the Spanish flu, they didn't have the communications. We're connected and we're all dealing with the same thing. And a few hundred of us holding a space of strong, powerful, guided, spiritual, calm energy, that all is going to radiate outward just as the fear epidemic has radiated, radiated outward and it too has an exponential growth curve that cannot be calculated but the positive effect of it could be unbelievable man the things that have touched me just a little bit that have gotten me out of difficult situations because someone stayed calm and did or said something kind and wise i can't count the number of times those little things have saved my life if you do little things big things any things that keep you on purpose as a spiritual being at this time being human, you will touch millions of lives. We just don't know exactly how it'll happen, but the uncertainty cuts both ways. It's a time, it is the best of times as well as the worst of times. So maybe we could have a, uh, a few questions here if the gracious badger can return and see her shadow for six more weeks of winter. You don't even know about that, do you? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, they bring out a wallaby in Australia. If he sees his shadow, they just 
all go underground. We haven't invented know. shadows yet. That's right. <clears throat> okay, so let's okay. have a question, Badger Girl. So, some questions. Denise asked early on, how do we get through this with our sanity intact? Now, you have addressed that. But Pretty much. address it again. Well, but I want to say I've just been looking at some of the, I can barely with my elderly eyes see the comments on my screen. And somebody said, I just want to hug you all. One of the best ways I know to stay sane is to get a hug. And a virtual hug works almost as well yes. as a physical hug. So reach out to each other and say, gosh, I'm really scared. Can we do a virtual hug? We could make that the gathering room virtual hug tradition. <laughs> like right now, I am out there giving each and every one of you a Me big too. virtual snuggle. And I'm telling you, I'm imagining snuggling you right now. I can feel you. And if you pay attention, you'll feel me too, because the imagination is magical. And that's a good way to stay sane. And then having a few conversations about it. Wow, all the toilet paper's gone. Yes, I'm using money in the bathroom now. Um, <laughs> I told her not to make that joke. <laughs> yeah, but I've made it twice anyway. Um, the, the laughter, the sharing, the, the uh, confessing our fears, all of these, ironically, this is a time of bonding together, even as we distance to keep each other from being infected. Yeah. It can be, everything's paradoxical in a dualistic system, right? Yeah. So as we isolate in our homes, we're gonna reach out even more assertively to be with people who can, com can communicate online about the same thing. And we don't even have to know them. We're united by our fears and our hopes and everything that's happening to us. It's a great time to make friends. <laughs> I mean that. <laughs> That's, no one put Martha out of context on this. <laughs> right. Hugs and making. We all know what we mean. We mean virtual hugs. We mean and we're real all friends. being safe. Yes. And we're all doing our social distancing. Yes. Like good safe things. huggings. So Donna asks, how do we deal with those who are so judgmental about how others are dealing with the virus? Oh, God. Put yourself in their shoes for 10 minutes. Like the on the days when you had like people screaming at you either at work or little kids at home or um, angry family members or whatever, and you were feeling run down and you were terrified you'd get sick and you were terrified you're, you wouldn't be able to sustain your income. Weren't you ever kind of a bitch, whether male or female, to somebody else? I'm trying to give people a big benefit of the doubt. If somebody pushes me aside in the grocery store, I'm gonna take a deep breath and go, that person is terrified. And I know it sounds sanctimonious, but I'm going to say to them in my heart, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be free from suffering, may you be protected from all inner and outer harm. And as I say that, the loving wish that is coming from the force to that person flows through me. And this I can tell you from 30 years of coaching, when you focus love on another being, especially one who's being an absolute pig, when you finally get to the place where you can say, be well, be protected, be happy. The love that you get because you've become an avenue for them is amazing because the love is reaching even harder for the people who are most crazed right now. It wants them to heal and you will feel that. And it is a little miracle in your own body. I think that is almost the answer to every single one of these questions, but I'm still going to read them out. Yes, let's just say it again. Anne Can't say it too many times. That's right. Anne-Marie says, with all the new restrictions coming every moment, how do we resist the instinct to hoard food and trust what we need will be available in the days to come? I don't want to buy too much and take from others, but I'm nervous. Well, you take the gracious badger to, <laughs> to the store and she says two peanut butters is enough. <laughs> no, I just I well was enough. barely got off the phone with a dear friend um, from Italy and his family, he's here in the States, but his family's in Italy and I was asking about them and he said, the first instinct everyone had was to raid the grocery stores. So it got, all the food went away. But he said, here's the thing. This is not like a nuclear explosion. It's not like an Ebola that's killing everyone it touches. So the grocery stores filled back up again. The supply chains were restored. We've never seen this particular type of global phenomenon ever. And one of the, you know, grace things we get right now is Supply lines will not go to the point of starvation. This is not World War II. Martha's not a medical expert and she doesn't know what will happen in the future. I don't future. know what will Disclaimer. happen in the future. But, okay. Yeah, thank you. 
you take the gracious badger with you and she corrects all the stupid mistakes you make. But she cannot stop touching your face. What, <laughs> what I do want to say though is um, if we look to another country as a model, Italy for one has been able to keep necessities available. So um, there's not, again, we want to stay in that alert but not panicking phase. And um, they uh, go to your CDC and your HWO advisories. The last ones I read say WHO. WHO. Whom? Go to the whom. The who is advising us. No, the whom. <laughs> um, and they said buy a few extra things, but you don't need to buy out the store. So Math is not a medical or um, that's the last thing expert. I read. Do what you want. Go to do what CDC, you want. go to WHO, yeah. we're not giving do not you advice on how to live your life. Listen yeah. to the experts. Yes. There we go. And as for the fear of it, um, it just uh, after you've bought the supplies that you think are necessary, this is what I did, I sat down and meditated and looked at my fear. And there was a part of me that was very animal and that was very like feral and crazed. And in my mind, I got that feral crazed part of me. It was a possum, by the way. It showed up as a possum. They are not attractive animals. And I had it sit in my lap, and I imagined just petting it and saying, oh, it, yes, I get it, I get it. And it was just playing dead. Ah, ah, ah. And it calmed me down. So as I said, there are two tracks here. There's the literal track of what's happening in the world, and then there's the track of what's happening in our brains. And we want to keep, we want to flatten the curve in both places. Keep it at that sp spot of alert, but not frightened. Mm -hmm. Find the humor in it. Find the comfort. Find the love. Give it to yourself. Give it to others. Love actually flips that toggle switch in your brain. That it will go either to fear or to love. And if you switch it to love, the fear goes down. You can flatten the curve by saying, I will find something to love. That's interesting. Pam was asking about... Um when your mind is calm, but you have fear in your body, would it work for that? I think that if you're not in a state of physical emergency, there's no predator in the room, there's no, um, you're, you're basically physically comfortable. The only way you can have fear in the body is that part of the mind believes there's danger. Mm -hmm. The body, when it doesn't think there's danger, it relaxes. So it's got, it can be a very deep, almost subconscious fear. But if you're not in danger right now in the room where you're sitting and your body feels fear, you're frightened of your thoughts. And the interesting thing is, the less you're frightened of your thoughts, the more actively you can respond to physical danger in the room. Hmm. You'll be paralyzed by terrifying thoughts. But if you're just calmly present, we talked about that last week, if you're really fully present, you won't be afraid until there is something to be afraid of. And then you'll work in a relaxed way to do what's right to cope with that emergency but if you're afraid and there's nothing scary in the room go deeper i didn't have like a story in my head that was saying buy peanut butter i had a possum okay and it was saying ah! there was no you know how you how you do the analytical thought work on ah! <laughs> so true. You know, so i just held it and i just petted its nasty skanky little fur Everyone knows Australian possums are delightful, right? I They're adorable. That American these, these possums are, those, are just... Are those ones. They're, I love them. I love all animals, but they're not the most attractive. Let's get on. Let's get back right. to the topic. All right, great. Um, this is actually flows on well from what you were saying because Karen was asking, it's hard to know where the line between staying educated on current events and avoiding is. I do find myself wanting to numb out. Do you have suggestions on how to cope with the anxiety? But I also like that question. About it's interesting. Yeah, it really is. Where, where it feels like you're like, oh, oh, my body's pulling forward, my eyes are open wide, I'm interested in this. That, that means good, you're, in, you're taking in good information. And it's exactly the same, same way you'll lean forward across a dinner table if someone says, brings up a topic that interests you, your pupils get larger, um, your energy gets higher, that's when you know you're sort of in the zone of something that you should be paying attention to. Then there comes a place where you've been paying attention, but it's starting to feel like you're just being, you're, you're rubbing your face on a cheese grater. It's just like, oh, I can't, Ugh, but I should. Oh, there's more details. Oh, and they'll try to hook you into the news with more scary headlines. And you're like, oh, but my face is on a cheese grater. <laughs> That's the time when you just say, you know what? 
I'm going to go binge watch a really delightful artistic TV series right now that's about the 1700s or something. You know, that's, that's the time you take a step back. And that's the luxury we have right now. A lot of us are under quarantine. Some of us may even be ill. God bless you. Even so, there are things we can do to care for ourselves, and they involve all these magical technologies like virtual hugs and TV shows that last for 10 hours and are delightful. <laughs> yes. And use them all, use them all, and to keep yourself in that place where you're like, oh, but never to the place where you're uh, just feeling here what's too much. Yeah. Yeah. And what's not enough. I mean, so I wake up going, what's happening? And then when I get the download, I'm like, oh, I calm down. Yeah. 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 Um, I can't find the exact question, but people, someone was saying, you know, that there's a sense of sadness that comes from the sense of what, what have we done here as a species to bring ourselves here? Other concerns come flooding in. I know for me, like these dystopic images from movies oh, and yeah. stuff come, come in really readily and I, I so I really relate to whoever asked that sorry I can't I'm remember. really glad you asked that and there's a related question that I wanted to bring up and that is that we will all have to grieve our expectations yes. of what this spring summer season we're going to be like rest of our lives rest of our lives <laughs> <laughs> sorry. we don't know That's that you're going down That's the other end of... <laughs> 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 um, but this spring this summer may be very different from what we expected a lot of gatherings may be canceled a lot of travel may be canceled um things like i mean telling my son he couldn't go to the gym you know he has he has down syndrome so it's not like he can really understand why and it's heartbreaking and you even something as stupid and little as that i mean it's nothing i don't believe me i don't think i'm a persecuted by life but it was painful yeah. to to disappoint him in that way and um you're gonna to have to grieve as you let go. And there will be those stages of grieving. The first thing is, I'm not gonna cancel that. You know, that for sure is gonna happen. And then, I mean, we saw this, we had some African friends going to a conference and while they were in the air, the conference was canceled. And at first it was like, but we're going to several things, so they can't all be, oh, they're all canceled, okay. And, and you watch that bargaining, it's a disbelief bargaining, um then sometimes anger like why is this happening to me i want you know it was my wedding for heaven's mm. sake it was my wedding yeah. you know um and you you deserve to have those feelings you're going to have them don't try to suppress them because an emotional reaction to a loss is necessary to go beyond it otherwise you get stuck in it and then the yeah. sadness when you go oh my god it really i'm really gonna have to postpone my wedding or whatever it was you have to grieve this spring and summer as you thought they would be. I just looked at my calendar going forward and went, not that, not that, not that. And and I had to sit and cry for a while. And then I was like, all right, okay, let's roll up our sleeves, wash our hands and see what's next. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is just the, the horror of the, the magnitude of what we as a species are doing to one another, to ourselves, to the earth. Again, we've never faced anything like this in history. I've spent my entire adult life focused on this one issue. And after going all kinds of different directions, you know, conservationism, education of women in third world countries, like all these different measures that can help, really can help, uh, like things like overpopulation and, and destruction of ecosystems, the thing that I've come back to over and over again is that when you talk to the masters, they say, as within, so without. You cannot create a, a healing of the world if you don't have healing within yourself. And that got me from the brink of insanity to feeling um, on track again and in my integrity. If I go within myself right now, as this thing happens, if I grieve the things we're all losing, if I can love the parts of myself and those around me that are afraid, affected, ill, angry, raging, hostile, if I can love all those things inside myself, if I can pet that nasty little possum until it calms down, if I can wash my hands and keep this body clean and free of disease, 
and also clean and free of the disease of paranoia and panic and hatred and clamping down. If I can keep myself healthy and whole, which come from the same root, that makes me the seed of, of a new, I, I can be patient zero in a healing that goes out the same way a virus spreads. And if we do that, if even a critical mass of us do that, that's what we're learning from this. It doesn't take that many people to spread something all over the world. And if we can make this a torrent of love, it could go everywhere. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Martha Beck. Mwah. We are loving and hugging you so hard. So many virtual hugs. So stay well, stay hopeful, Look stay after funny, each other. And um, we'll all be seeing each other on social media and holding each other in our hearts always, 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 always. all yeah. over the world. Mwah. All right. Mwah. We'll see you next week, everyone.